welcome everyone to the Rogers TV London 2021 Federal Election Debate. This debate is for the London North Centre riding. There are five confirmed candidates. In alphabetical order, Mark Emery for the People's Party, Peter Fragiscados for the Liberal Party, Stephen Gallant for the Conservative Party, Mary Ann Hodge for the Green Party, and Dirka Prout for the New Democratic Party. I'm your moderator, Brona Morgan. You may recall I've been a Green Party candidate in the past, but today I'm representing Rogers TV. We are committed to bringing you a fair and unbiased debate to help our viewers make informed choices on September 20th. The questions I'll be asking the candidates were gathered through our social media channels and through public outreach and have all been vetted to ensure that they are fair and unbiased. Thank you to everybody who responded to our call for questions. We hope you get answers. The candidates attending our debate today are Peter Fragiscados, Marianne Hodge, and Dirka Prout. Stephen Gallant indicated that he was unavailable for the debate. And Mark Emery is not present today based on a policy of our host venue requiring disclosure of fully vaccinated status. Both have been afforded an opportunity to provide recorded statements that will air following this debate if we have them by the time of broadcast. The format for our debate is as follows. Each candidate will be afforded one minute to make an opening statement, one minute to make a closing statement, and one minute to respond to each of the questions. If a rebuttal is warranted to any of the other candidates' responses, they will be afforded 30 seconds for that rebuttal. Numbers were drawn prior to our broadcast to determine the seating arrangement and the order of our opening statements. We'll progress through that order as we ask your questions for the next hour, giving all of our candidates an opportunity to answer first, second, and third. You'll understand it as it happens. We'll go in reverse order for the numbers drawn for our candidates' closing statements. Now let's get started. Peter Fragiscados for the Liberal Party drew number one, so he'll give the first opening statement. Thank you very much, Brona, and I want to thank Rogers yet again for being a great community partner in organizing this event, and of course, Aeolian Hall for doing what they do, bringing us together. The honor of my life has been to serve as the Member of Parliament now for almost six years. I want to continue that work. I'm asking for your support on September 20th so I can continue to be a voice for this city and particularly for this constituency. At a time when Parliament has basically ceased to function, for example, in June, we only barely passed the budget of 2021. We need to make sure that all of us are seized with the issues of the day, and that means putting issues back, putting this election back to citizens, so citizens can look at the different visions on offer and make a judgment on which party is best positioned, which party has the best plan for getting us out of the pandemic and dealing with the future. I want to be that voice in the Liberal Party for that voice local, nationally. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Next, we'll hear opening statements from Marianne Hodge for the Green Party. Thank you for inviting me here today. Last night at the environment debate, everyone was acknowledging that the climate crisis is indeed a crisis. Every party will try to convince you that their climate plan is best. You know that old saying, the best time to plant a tree was 40 years ago? The same holds true for the climate. I have been engaged with the climate crisis since the 90s when working in facilities management and writing articles about reducing construction waste. I put forward the motion to declare a climate emergency in 2019 and have since started a group called Climate Action London to help engage people in climate actions big and small. I am involved in the homeless crisis as a member of the fundraising team for Indwell because you cannot think about the climate when you don't have a home. I am involved with youth as a foster parent and as a board member of Camp Kimoki. We have run out of time to talk. The Green Party knows what it takes to tackle the climate crisis. Let this election be the beginning of real action. Thank you so much, Marianne. And finally, we'll hear opening statement from Dirka Prout for the New Democratic Party. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and for inviting us to present. My name is Dirka Prout. I'm running to be your NDP Member of Parliament in London North Centre. 
You know, in London, people are worried about jobs, the health of our loved ones, and the public services that everyone counts on. And every day at the doorsteps, I hear from people who are struggling to keep up. They see that our economy is doing well, but only for the rich. Decades of liberal and conservative governments have stripped away the services that made it possible to live a good life. It's harder to afford a good place to live, to pay for an education, to take care of aging parents, and to cover the cost of housing, electricity, cell phone bills, prescription medications, and dentist appointments. But we can make different choices. We can invest in things like health care, affordable housing, and child care. We can tackle the things that keep people up at night and make sure everyone has a good life. If we want different results, we need to make different choices. Thanks, Electorica. All right, now we're going to move on to the question period of our debate. So as I mentioned, we gathered a lot of questions through our social media accounts. This one came in through Twitter. And we will start with Marianne Hodge. A lot of people were helped through the pandemic by government assistance programs, including SERB. The government decided on $2,000 a month as an emergency amount to meet basic needs. If $2,000 is an amount deemed necessary to get by, this amount is still well below a living wage. Why do disabled individuals living in Ontario receive about half that amount? How are these individuals expected to get by, especially with housing and rental costs continuing to increase? Do you support raising that amount that ODSP recipients receive? So we'll start with Marianne. Thank you. Uh, the Green Party uh, is one of the parties that has always been supporting a guaranteed livable income and basic income. And uh, living is, is a human right. And it doesn't matter whether you have uh, a disability or if you are uh, find yourself uh, here in, in the case of a pandemic uh, without an income. Uh, there are basic costs that are involved in, in living, and uh, the Green Party supports, uh, has always supported a guaranteed basic income because um, it, it is important for us to ensure that humans uh, can survive in this, in this world, and um, uh, we all, uh, sorry, <laughs> we all um, want to um, protect and be compassionate and be uh, um, helpful to our, our community. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Next, we'll hear from Dirk Prout from the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you for this important question. You know, during the pandemic, the NDP fought to bring up CERB. Uh, the Liberals were planning to give $1,000 a month, and we, um, incre we pushed to increase it to $2,000 a month. And yes, you're quite right. This is not enough to live on, which is why in our platform we have a, a provision for a guaranteed livable wage. We also want to set an example for provinces, because I realize that ODSP is a provision provincial matter, and there are um, uh, federal uh, disability benefits that I'll get to in a moment, but we want to set an example by starting to increase the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour and then moving up to $20 an hour. Disabled persons did not get CERB, and they have to wait three years for a disability benefit. We think that's incorrect, and that's why we're pushing for a guaranteed livable income. And for those that live in um, long-term care, we want to make sure that there's consistent standards and uh, care for them um, as they go forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jerka. And finally, we'll hear from Pre Peter Fragiscatos for the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. Ms. Perot is quite right. ODSP is a provincial responsibility, and we will push, of course, for the Ford government to do more. I only hazard to guess what an Aaron O'Toole government would do uh, in terms of relationship with the provinces and what that means for people in need. Uh, CERB was a tremendous policy. It helped to get people through the pandemic. It played its role in sustaining families, and that's why we introduced it. The NDP was certainly at the table, but uh, the government, in deciding on the $2,000 amount, took its cue from citizens and listened to its members of parliament. Uh, I would wrap up on this to say simply that housing is absolutely critical.
cycle. Affordable housing with wraparound supports in place. We've seen hundreds of units built in this city alone, and that is available for individuals with physical disabilities in need, and we want to continue this work. Let's not go off the track. We're on the right, we have a plan, the plan is working, and we need to continue the national housing strategy. Thanks, Peter, and thanks everybody for those great answers. So since housing came up, obviously it's on everybody's mind. We got questions on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere about housing. We'll start with Durka this time. Housing has been become a huge issue for Londoners. Over the past few years, home prices have gone way up, rentals are harder to find, and there are more Londoners unhoused. What needs to be done to remedy the issue and keep people housed? So Durka, proud NDP. Okay, thank you very much. I have met people at the doors who complain about not only the price of housing, but also the quality of housing. Um, we just had a question about disabilities. People with disabilities have to wait too long for this housing. And uh, oftentimes when they do get it, they have problems with accessibility. So the NDP proposes to build a half a million units across Canada, that's our minimum amount, making sure that they're energy efficient so that people do not fall into energy poverty, where too much of their rent goes to paying for um, energy, you know, energy coverage. And we want to make them also accessible. Um, universally, universal design is something I think we should strive for as a policy. In addition, um, for people who uh, receive um, who uh, rent, we want to make sure that there is uh, a rental assistance for them, uh, that they can um, avoid being homeless. Thanks, Jerka. Next, we'll hear from Peter Fragiscatos, the Liberal Party candidate. I agree with Ms. Prout that housing is absolutely fundamental to dignity. That's why we need to continue the national housing strategy. The goals that Ms. Prout talks about can be achieved if we simply continue on the track that we're on. That national housing strategy, as I mentioned before, has had tangible, real, concrete benefits for Londoners, particularly in terms of dealing with homelessness. Challenge that we're grappled with, but we need to continue with, and a re-elected Liberal government will ensure that continues. Certainly, there's an other side to housing, which is the affordability aspect. We've put forward a plan that will allow for home ownership to become possible. Uh, we've put forward a plan that allows for tax-free savings accounts to be created to put towards down payments, and for speculative practices in the real estate sector to come to an end. We need to bring down the price of housing and, of course, increase the amount of supply, and we'll do that in partnership with municipalities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. And finally, we'll hear from Marianne Hodge for the Green Party. Thank you. Housing is a human right, and shelter is one of our basic needs. Until we feel a sense of security, we have no ability to think about issues like climate change. As a homeowner and a landlord, I see this issue from both sides. There's no security as a tenant. We hear too many stories of tenants who are ousted because the landlord wants to improve the building to get higher rents. And on the landlord's side, costs such as insurance and property taxes are escalating well beyond the 2% allowable rent increases, making some long-term tenancies challenging. But when we commodify housing, it then moves from a right to an investment. When housing becomes a business like the Airbnb industry, higher house prices are recouped in higher rent costs homeowners can't compete. If we believe that people have a right to housing, then we need to ensure there's adequate supply. Governments at all levels need to work together to solve this problem, to create walkable communities with greater density, to make infrastructure costs more affordable, and providing access to green spaces for all. Thanks, Marianne, and thanks everybody again. Great direct answers. Our next question again is coming from Twitter. John McCall states, desperate people have reached out to their MPs for the last 18 months with various pleas, some in a crisis, begging for a chance to say final goodbyes to a loved one, to help a family member in need, only to be ignored or provided a late generic answer. How will you work to restore accountability to government so people can all get the help that they deserve, not just people with connections? We'll start with Peter Fragiscatos, the Liberal Party candidate. Well, I appreciate the question especially because the pandemic has really made clear the importance of members of parliament and their offices. I mentioned before that the honor of my life has been to serve as the MP for London North Centre. 
Uh, that honor is especially underlined because during the pandemic, myself and our office literally assisted thousands of individuals, families, and businesses, making sure they, they had access to the emergency supports that the federal liberal government made available. We've continued that. We want to see that effort through. And uh, so long as, as I'm uh, the MP here, I'm going to make sure that every person has that representation. I make calls. We answer emails. We want to continue that surface. It's, uh, it's, it's service that I take very, very seriously. Thanks, Peter. And next we'll hear from Marianne Hodge, the Green Party candidate. Thank you. Um, accountability is very important for government because uh, people are counting on uh, the ability to um, live their lives in a way that uh, doesn't um, always put them against obstacles. And we've seen that with COVID, there are a lot of obstacles in, um, in our lives that have to be overcome. And one of these is uh, this election. And um, having an election during a pandemic is a very challenging thing. And it doesn't really allow people the ability to get together and talk about uh, issues that are important. And um, for governments to be uh, creating an election at this time, I think it's very uh, uh, um, careless because uh, we know that we have so many things that we have to comply with and they seem to not be so um, required during an election time. So thank you. Thanks, Marianne. And finally, same question to Dirk Prout, the NDP candidate. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCall, for that important question. Accountability begins with the reason why you're running. And I think um, based on the social democratic principle of we are accountable to the people, um, I definitely want to say that I'm running to serve the people of London North Center. What I'm concerned about is that too many people feel that their vote don't count. Um, we're all traveling along the same river, for example, and not all of us are being represented. So it's important that we have electoral reform, that we have different voices at the table. The Liberal government did not follow through with their promise to make 2015 the last election that uh, was for under first past the post. I think this is an important step uh, electoral reform, that is, to have accountability. We also want to take big money out of politics um, so that politics is not only for the rich and connected, rich and well connected, but for everyone because uh, we are, exist to serve the people. Great lead into our next question. So thanks for that, Durka. From a London North Centre resident via Facebook, proportional representation. No party with only 39% of the vote should get 100% of the power. We've heard promises about proportional representation for 100 years. What are your personal thoughts on this? And what's your party's position? So we will start with Marianne Hodge for the Green Party. Thank you. For too long, we have been thinking and working in silos. Today's problems are complex and interrelated. And they need governments and opposition parties that will work together to develop smart strategies, not act like, well, I was going to say children, but we actually expect better from our children. Today's problems require collaboration, not competition. If debate was used to find the right solution instead of criticizing the other parties, every party would be invested in every solution to make them work. We don't need governments who only want to work in a majority situation, who seek to do things their way. The Green Party supports the creation of a National Citizens Assembly who would be charged with learning about different forms of government from industry leaders and suggest to Canadians a system that would allow everyone's voice to be heard and counted. Political systems are complex and require more than a straw poll vote. We are facing challenging times and we need a government that puts Canadians ahead of power politics. Awesome. Thanks for that answer, Marianne. Next, we'll hear more about electoral reform from Durka Prout, New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, in 2019, people said to me, uh, Durka, you know, I want you guys to work together. And I listened and took that to heart. The NDP caucus also listened and took that to heart, and they work to improve with the Liberals to improve CERB and to improve C12, the Climate Promptability Act. 
Liberal and conservative governments have benefited a lot from false majorities, which they are seeking again. And it, you know, this exaggerates regional differences and leaves too many without a voice. The NDP will bring in mixed member proportional in this first mandate of government so that we can increase local representation and have uh, a system that is reflected of the choice of parties that people make, where, you know, a party that just goes with 7% wouldn't get 25 seats, for example. Establish an in, we will also, like the Green Party, establish an independent citizens assembly. And I think this will go a long way of making our politics more civil and representative and working for you. Thanks, Durka. And finally, Peter Fragiscatos for the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. This question of electoral reform is an important one, but our country has already had that national conversation. Our parliament has had a national conversation on it as well. What was clear after 2015 was that there's no alternative that Canadians prefer to first pass the post. There is no consensus. I know that there's many out there that prefer proportional representation. The question is, which type of proportional representation? There's variants of it. And my own view is that first past the post, while it does have flaws, there's no perfect system, it has allowed for a country where the charter of rights is in place. A public health care system is in place. If the Conservatives come to office, we will see what happens to that. Of course, Mr. O'Toole has promised, uh, in part, while he doesn't want to get rid of the public system, he would allow for the flourishing of a private system. First past the post allows for people's voices to be heard. Electoral reform and moving towards it is not a panacea. We need to focus on people. We need to give them the service that they deserve. And that's what I, think, that's what I will continue to do as the Member of Parliament in London North Centre. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, everybody. Great answers again. Next question, we'll start with Durka. From a local public servant via Instagram. Our country is literally up in flames, and the impacts of climate change are far-reaching, everything from food production to soaring municipal insurance costs. How do you commit to addressing these issues? Dirko Prout for the NDP. Hi, thanks for this question. You know, I grew up in the Caribbean, and I have never experienced 42 degrees or more uh, temperatures, but I did experience that when I was attending a funeral of a loved one in, uh, in BC in June. And I know that uh, there are people who have lost their homes and livelihoods, and it's incumbent that we must do something to not only um, help people who are affected by climate change in our own city, in our own country, but internationally. The NDP commits to protecting 30% of our lands, airs, and uh, land and water, whether freshwater or seawater, by 2050. We will um, reduce uh, emissions by um, compared to 2005 levels by 50%. I would note that this is both higher than the um, uh, liberal and conservative value. And we will immediately stop fossil fuel subsidies because, and we certainly will not uh, continue with pipeline production. Thank you. Thanks, Durka. Same question, Peter Fragiscatos, liberal. Well, the federal NDP may wish to end pipeline construction, but it's the Alberta NDP that wanted the TMX pipeline, but we'll leave that for another matter, or another moment, rather. On climate change, look, uh, the pandemic is the challenge of the moment. Climate change is the challenge of our time. It's the most important issue to me. My wife is expecting our first child in October, and the issue of climate change becomes that much more of a responsibility. That's why the federal government has acted. Uh, we've put in place a price on carbon. We have put in place enormous protections for our oceans. 25% is the goal that we will soon reach. Right now, we're at close to 14%, and only 1% of, co of our oceans were protected in 2015 when we formed office. Enormous investments in public transit, including $200 million to, pr to further improve London's transit system, cycling paths, the, London West, the West London Dyke, excuse me, for climate mitigation. All of these things have happened in just the past, the past few years because of federal investment. I'll continue to fight for London to make sure that continues. All right, next we're gonna afford Marianne Hodge an opportunity to respond to that question for the Green Party. For 25 years, the Green Party has been advocating for climate action. And although we have not won many seats in Parliament, the voice of Greens across Canada has led all political parties to adopt our ideas. I can spout a lot of promises to you today about what the Greens would do if we were in power, but we have learned that talk is cheap. 
Promises are often broken and targets extend well past the four-year election mandate. The hard truth is that we have choices to make. The pandemic spending means that we now have even less resources. The key is to finding win-win opportunities. How can we improve Canadians' health while improving the health of the planet? How can we support workers while investing in a clean energy economy? How can we make housing affordable and more energy efficient? The Green Party won't sacrifice your children's future health to corporate profits. We know that where the money flows, action grows. The question you need to ask is, what would you like to see grow? Thanks, Marianne. And Durko would like to have a short rebuttal to, I think, Peter's comment on this. So Durko, proud NDP. Yes. Um, I think uh, the TMX pipeline has been shown by the Parliamentary Budget Office to not be something that is feasible in terms of if we want to really get to net zero by 2050. Um, it, so it's, it's not financially feasible and it's not feasible in terms of if we want to achieve our climate goals. Thank and, you. And a rebuttal to that rebuttal from Peter Fragiscatos, Liberal. Very quickly. The alternative to a pipeline would be rail. Oil does remain the lifeblood of our modern economy. And the reality is, is that while we move towards a green energy economy, which the federal government is pushing, pushing forward, we're doing hand in hand uh, with environmental organizations and provinces, the reality is, is that rail is far more dangerous than pipelines. And every royalty, every cent from the royalty that the federal government obtains from the TMX pipeline goes into green energy projects and green technologies. That's the truth. Marianne, response? Sure. Uh, well, again, where money flows, action uh, grows. So if we, um, if we are just making uh, more uh, volume of, of oil production, we are going to be polluting more, which is going to cost us more in the long run because every emission that we put out, we then have to turn around and find a green technology to counteract that. So it's limiting um, the production of uh, fossil fuels is uh, wh where we need to be focusing our energies. So that was Marianne Hodge with the final rebuttal, I think, to that question, which was awesome. Very lively debate on that. Um, the next question, we'll start with Peter Fragiscatos. This is a pretty contentious one for everybody that I'm sure you've heard knocking on people's doors. We've got two opposing viewpoints in this question from our Facebook commenters. Number one, I have a question for all campaigns, and I'm a bit disappointed, to be honest. Why have you not insisted on all campaign workers and volunteers being double vaxxed and committed publicly to it? You are going to have to lead this country out of this pandemic, and you cannot even set the example yourselves. Surely public safety should come ahead of politics. The opposing viewpoint. Ask them if they will get rid of all vaccine mandates, as they are a gross violation of our civil rights. Tell them that there are a significant number of people who are basing their vote on this point almost exclusively. Peter Fragiscatos, Liberal. I am absolutely double vaccinated. Our volunteers are double vaccinated. This is a solemn responsibility. I have no time, quite frankly, for political parties. And this includes, the, of course, the People's Party, but we don't have to talk about them. The Conservative Party that didn't have the courage to show up here today has no policy in place to ensure that their candidates are vaccinated. Not just once, not just, but twice. I mean, this is unacceptable. And uh, for, a, for a party that wants to lead this country, I don't understand it. That's why the federal government or the federal liberal government, if, uh, if returned to office, will continue to call for mandatory vaccinations to take place, will help provinces pay for a system. If businesses wish to go in this direction, and I know that they do, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has been very vocal on this, we will ensure that if they're taken to court, that they're protected. This is about public safety, individual rights. Yes, they are inc incredibly important, but public safety matters too. It's a responsibility that we all share. Thanks, Peter. Next on that same question, we'll hear from Marianne Hodge for the Green Party. In society, we do subscribe to the need for certain regulations. People do not have total freedom to act however they want. We all wear seat belts or face a fine. We do not drive impaired or face possible jail time. Governments instill these regulations based on societal norms. 
As a society, we've deemed vaccines a way to reduce the impact of viruses, and almost all children receive standard vaccines before attending school. I believe it's within the government's role to put public safety ahead of individual freedoms. Many of us have never lived through a pandemic, but I believe that COVID-19 has presented us with an opportunity, an opportunity to show that we can come together as a global community to act together, to think of the benefit of others over ourselves, to remember the importance of community and supporting each other through challenges. It has highlighted inequalities in our society and how we undervalue service workers until they become essential workers. Thank you, Marianne. And finally, we'll hear from Dirka Prout, the NDP candidate. Hello, thank you for this important question. Um, there has been discussion of uh, the legality of um, vaccine mandates. And I would like to say we should have a framework that uh, uh, accommodates people's rights, as well as employment law, labor law, and human rights. But this framework has to consider people's health in, as paramount. And this is a public safety issue. The NDP has recognized it. All our uh, candidates and campaign staff and volunteers must be doubly vaccinated. Because in the face of the fourth wave, the Delta variant, people are rightly worried. And they're worried about sending their kids back to school, about harming seniors or people living with uh, disabilities. So this is our responsibility. I think that we must make uh, greater efforts to vaccinate people, especially those who are racialized and in lower, lower economic classes, who uh, may have certain valid concerns about not getting the vaccine. Um, this is why we've been pushing for uh, uh, getting more inclusive um, uh, approach to um, getting the vaccine out. Thanks, Thank you. Jerka. Thanks very much. All right, next question, we will start with Marianne Hodge. And this is kind of a melange of questions from all of our social media channels, as well as coming from me as somebody who was driving three children around yesterday morning to various schools across the city because there was no other option. Access to transit is on everyone's mind. The need for affordable, reliable, and, and consistent public transportation is a must for our city and our region, including access in our smaller communities. How would you address the issues that are stopping us from moving forward, literally, on moving people efficiently in our city and region? Marianne Hodge, the Green Party candidate. Thank you. That is such an important issue because as we talk about how we want to design our cities and what we like London to see, we see that there's wrestling about you know, whether to turn Wonderland Road into six lanes uh, to encourage more car traffic. And the Green Party supports all kinds of ways to make more active transportation easier for people. Things, uh, transportation is often uh, mostly a municipal uh, responsibility, but all levels of government are required in order to finance these big projects. And we see the opportunity to create more um, uh, opportunities for municipal governments to raise that, those monies and to create things like green bond funds where uh, um, they can, people in the community can support some of these projects. But as well, uh, financing the electrification of buses and providing money for greener technologies, including cycling. Thanks so much, Marianne. Next, we'll hear from Dirka Prout, the NDP candidate. Thank you for this question. Um, the provision of good public transportation is really important. We have had employers in this city complain that, uh, especially if their uh, places are in industrial districts, that their employees cannot get to work because there's an inadequate public transportation system. And this is an equity issue because there are some people who are captive passengers and um, they have no way of driving. Uh, so I'm, when I think of this, I, I think that the NDP's plan to bring in um, a Greyhound, a replacement for the loss of Greyhound across Canada with a public transportation service is going to be a game changer for both rural communities and even our own. Uh, the NDP also plans to bring in electrification of transit to make it not only more green, but um, uh, for anyone who wants to make transit free, we will also support that. And we also support a high-speed rail system between 
the Quebec Windsor corridor. Thank you. Thanks, Jerka. And finally, Peter Fragiscatos, Liberal Party. Well, we will certainly all agree on the importance of public transit. The problem, with all due respect to Ms. Prode and the NDP, is that their uh, platform is not costed. Uh, so they can make many promises about free transit. There is no costing of the plan. And today, the parliamentary budget officer also shed further negative light on the NDP proposals. One of the reasons that the federal Liberal uh, Party's platform has been so widely uh, recognized in a positive way by leading climatologists like the former BC Green Party leader Andrew Weaver, NDP, uh, the former NDP leader Tom Mulcair, uh, is that it takes public transit very seriously. We've invested $25 billion in the past six years in public transit, and $200 million of that has come to London. I fought very hard to secure that investment. I worked with others in the city and the municipality, other federal colleagues. We made it happen, and London's transit system can look towards brighter days and is looking at brighter days because of that investment. I want to continue to support transit, cycling, all of these green approaches that we have and that we're going to continue with. We're going to give a 30-second rebuttal to Dirka Prout to that response. Thank you very much. Um, there's been much talk about the Liberal plan, and yes, ours is costed, but the costing will be coming out soon. We don't need uh, costing to evaluate the Liberal plan. They have a track record. They've been in power for six continuous years, and in those six years, Canada has been the only G7 country that has seen its emissions rise uh, in that time. So there is a track record there. The NDP will not, um, uh, as I said, will not uh, provide fossil fuel subsidies. We will instead spend that in um, improving uh, the transition to a just and green economy. And I believe Peter Fragiscatos would like to rebut that rebuttal. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Well, when the Harper government made no investments towards a green economy, naturally we were going to have a difficult time. But we've made enormous progress. An oil-based economy, a natural resources-based economy such as Canada, will have difficulties. But we are now on the path towards net zero. That is legislated. And again, we have a costed plan that's been embraced so widely by the environmental community and the country's leading climate uh, scientists and from individuals from other parties, from the Greens, from the NDP, they're getting behind the Liberal plan. Thanks very much. Marianne Hodge, would you like a rebuttal? Sure. Um, the, um, the, the Liberals are, are talking about how that they um, have made a lot of improvements over the last uh, six years, but the fact remains that uh, we've been talking about a lot of these issues for many, many years. And what we need to see is more leadership to make the hard decisions, that uh, it's not just tinkering around the edges, but we need to make some major changes. And it requires leadership to, um, to transition our economy from natural resources to clean energy. Interestingly enough, we have a question coming up. So we're not going to have any further rebuttals on that one. Uh, this is another a two-parter from two London lawyers, one of whom is me. Should candidates be required to provide present valuation costing of their promises and segregate funds for those purposes upon election? It's easy to promise to spend $20 billion in five years, but it's a lot harder to find the actual fiscal room now. Part two, what do you think about making election promises a binding contract if your party forms the government? Consequences for breaching this contract could range from fines to jail time to removal from office. Minority governments are no excuse not to follow through on promises because minority governments happen all the time and are to be expected and planned for in making promises. We'll start with Dirk Prout, NDP. Hello. Yes, I certainly agree that um, minority governments are no excuse and, and certainly we would prefer our caucus to be at the table working along with all the parties to make Canada a better place. Um, on the matter of uh, binding, I would say that the NDP views our platform as commitments and what we would need to be able to uh, 
to have a, a plan where we could segregate funds and such is some transparency uh, about government accounting. Um, too often we hear stories of new governments being elected and then when the books are open, they really understand the scale of the financial problem uh, or problems and then have to work with it. So um, I think uh, in order to, to improve that, that's something that uh, needs to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Jerka. Next, we'll hear from Peter Fragiscatos, our Liberal Party candidate. Uh, thank you very much, Brenna. Uh, I suppose I'm answering directly to you since uh, your qu the question comes from you. Uh, to be simple about it, uh, candidates and the parties that they represent need to present costed platforms in election campaigns. The fact that uh, the NDP hasn't done so is a huge question mark. I look forward to seeing the costing of their platform, particularly when we know that most of their revenue uh, will apparently come from increasing taxes on billionaires. Uh, that's a discussion we can have, a warranted one, but when other countries have pursued that path, it has not done anything to generate revenue substantially. On the question about promises, uh, Brana, I think that it's a discussion that, uh, uh, in terms of contracts and the like, we can have that conversation, uh, but I think that uh, politicians need to keep to their provinces. There are constantly changing circumstances and contexts that need to be adapted to, but that doesn't excuse broken promises. Uh, we've uh, seen a government now for six years that's kept the vast majority of its provinces. Promises, excuse me, over 90% have been kept, and we want to continue that path. Thanks, Peter. And Marianne Hodge for the Green Party. Thank you. Great question, Brona, because I'm Happy to say that the Green Party was that, like the first uh, party to actually present a costed platform back in 2015. And uh, unfortunately, with this snap election, it doesn't give parties a chance to do some of that costing because, you know, we're supposed to be in a four year election cycle, not a two year election cycle. So uh, it really puts um, uh, other parties at a disadvantage on that side. Uh, but um, one of the things that I also want to mention is that it's the whole concept of self-regulated industries that we have seen that sometimes when uh, there is no outside um, oversight that the money isn't put aside. For example, abandoned oil wells. The, the Liberals talk about spending all their green dollars trying to re decommission these oil wells, but if self-regulated industries actually were responsible, we wouldn't have that issue. So we do have to look at not just government being um, putting some of this money aside for promises, but industry as well. I'd love to grant some rebuttals there, but we're getting close to the end, and I want to make sure we get to some more of our um, citizens' questions. Our venue host has a great one about Canada's role on the international stage. What should Canada's role be in situations like, like Afghanistan? Specifically, should Canada be part of prolonged wars in the future? And for that question, we will start with Peter Fragiscatos, our Liberal Party candidate. Canada has a responsibility to work with allies to ensure international security. The situation in Afghanistan is obviously tragic beyond words. It defies description. I've worked with constituents who have family members in Afghanistan, in Kabul. Uh, it is a situation that uh, I've heard from them. I care deeply about those families, and I'll continue to do everything I can. Uh, if re-elected, obviously, we have called for up to 20,000 Afghan refugees to enter Canada, and in fact, over 3,000 individuals were evacuated by Canada in the past few weeks. They've settled in over 20 communities uh, in Canada already, including in London, but there's more we can do, and we will base that model, that approach rather, on the Syrian experience uh, that proved so successful. Over 60,000 Syrian refugees have come to Canada. The Conservatives have pledged to end government-sponsored refugee programs, period. And that is not a Canadian, that is not a Canadian value. That is unacceptable, and the Liberal government wants to continue a compassionate approach. Thanks, Peter. Next, we'll hear from Marianne Hodger, a Green Party candidate. Thanks. Canada has a long tradition as peacekeepers, and every Green Party around the world subscribes to the same Global Greens Charter, and one of the six core values is in this charter is nonviolence. Canada's role in the Middle East should be to reduce tensions, find working solutions, and uphold international humanitarian law, not to take sides in chronic conflicts. But we have a duty and an obligation to look after the safety and security of Canadians abroad and those that have served Canada through their work alongside Canada's governmental organizations and nonprofits. 
who have been working in Afghanistan and other countries to improve human rights and serve children. Canada needs to take a more prominent role in ensuring human rights are respected around the globe, especially as we can expect governments to destabilize with climate change. Thanks, Marianne. And finally, Durka Prout, our NDP candidate. Yes, um, it is very lamentable, the situation in Afghanistan. Perhaps uh, back 20 years ago when the Western countries decided to embark on a mission there, it should have been thought through a lot more deeply. But unfortunately, here we are. And I'm glad that uh, local London um, communities like the cross uh, organizations like the Cross uh, Cultural Learners has been able to help Afghani um, uh, refugees. The NDP believes in a foreign policy based on human rights and peace and, and, and resolving conflicts in, in peaceful ways, not selling weapons to our uh, so-called allies. Um, Canada should not be involved in prolonged wars. And when these refugees come here, they should be given more supports. Uh, that is something that we believe in, including family reunification and protecting newcomers with dignity and respect. And as for the Afghan uh, veterans uh, from our Canadian forces, the NDP also commits to doing more to um, improve their welfare. Thanks, Dirk, and thanks everybody for those great answers. Um, we've got time for maybe one and maybe another half of question. We're starting with Marianne, I believe, for this one. It's Marianne's turn. A few months ago, leaders of Canada's federal political parties converged on London to pay their respects following one of the worst acts of terrorism many of us have ever lived through. Commitments were made to stamp out hate in our country. What have you and your party done since then? What concrete progress has been made? Marianne Hodge, Green Party. Canada prides itself on being multicultural, but we have a long way to go. And this summer was a wake up call for Londoners. Whether it is guns or pickup trucks that are used to kill people, at the root is someone who feels disenfranchised and powerless. It reminds me of the saying, no man is an island. The pain of the disenfranchised become our collective pain when they strike out. Growing up in London, I experienced an attitude that everyone should look out for themselves, become independent, that there must be something wrong with you if you can't afford your own house or even a car, as this is the land of opportunity. But during COVID, this dynamic has changed. We saw the importance for reaching out to our neighbors to offer help, to express gratitude, or just to let them know that they are not alone. And we are richer for that experience. Thanks, Marianne. Next, we'll hear from Dirk Prout for the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Um, Islamophobia and other forms of racial or uh, religious discrimination should be soundly condemned. And the NDP is committed to fighting all forms of, of uh, discrimination. You know, unfortunately, we do live in a country that is built on colonialism. And we need to decolonize. Um, and it, this has affected both indigenous, black, and uh, Asian people, Muslims, and Jews. So the NDP proposes to take on white supremacists and, and uh, neo-Nazi groups uh, with a national action plan to dismantle racism. We want to bring in a recording system to make sure that uh, we keep track of, of uh, these uh, despicable people. Uh, we want to bring a national working group to counter online hate. And uh, we want to work with evidence-based methods uh, that uh, um, keep uh, the data so we can know who is affected and um, develop the proper response. Thank you. Thanks, Jerka. And finally, Peter Fragiscatos, our Liberal Party candidate. The work that Ms. Pro quite rightly identifies in terms of countering white supremacy, white nationalism, racism, uh, very important. And I think it's a point of obviously we all agree on. We are uh, already engaged in that. A number of white supremacist organizations have been banned. Uh, we will continue that work if reelected. Of course, we all saw what happened to the Afsal family a few months ago, uh, an act of terrorism, an act of murder in our city. I will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Muslim community of this city and all visible minority groups 
who face racism. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have organized national summits, though. After, the, after what happened to the Afsal family, there was a national summit on Islamophobia and anti-Semitism that has led to tangible outcomes. There is now a movement towards dealing with online hate because our social media organizations need to live up to the responsibility. There is too much hate that is per uh, perpetuated online. It's not acceptable, and we will fight it. We'll fight it through legislation that the federal Liberal government has proposed. Thank you, everybody, to those well thought out responses to that tough question. We have come to that time in the debate where we are just about to wrap up. So it's time to hear closing statements from the three candidates who have joined us today. We're gonna to go in reverse order. So the first closing statement will be from Dirk Prout, our new Democratic Party candidate. One minute. Thank you very much. We have seen um, in this election, it's an opportunity. An opportunity to change course. To change course to correct our housing crisis. To make sure that the um, ordinary person is not neglected. To make sure that their um, home can be accessible and livable for um, their entire life. Uh, where a home is not someplace that you get trapped in, but uh, you can uh, have enjoyment. Um, we have seen also there is a choice to be made um, with respect to climate. Who can be trusted to lead us through this difficult time? We have to, there's a reason why activists say climate change, not uh, system change, not climate change. We want to fundamentally change the system and bring it in a green, low carbon economy that works not just for people, but also for the planet. Choose NDP on September the 20th. Thank you. Thank you so much, Durka. Next, we'll hear closing statement from Marianne Hodge, our Green Party candidate. Thank you. We cannot imagine the future we must create. We can no longer tinker with the way things are. We need to have imagination and courage to move beyond fossil fuels and corporate lobbying to a future we can't yet picture and can only dream about. But dreams can become reality if we truly believe they are possible. Where time and energy flows, action grows. We need to invest more of our resources into developing the future, not propping up the past. Few people could have dreamed of the innovations we have now. In 120 years, we have gone from learning to fly to joyriding in space. When we look to history, we see that it only takes a few people to change the world, and electing just a few green MPs can change our future profoundly. How close do the forest fires or floodwaters have to come before we say enough is enough? This election, are you ready for politics done differently? Are you ready to vote green? Thank you, Mary Ann. And finally, we'll hear a closing statement from Peter Fragiscatos, Liberal Party. Thank you very much. When the federal budget of April 2021 almost didn't pass a few months ago, it, it proved incredibly worrying. That budget included the extension of emergency supports for Canadians and for Londoners. So the minority parliament is in need of renewal. We need the citizens of this country and city to help us renew it. It's in your hands. Which vision do you want? Which vision of the country do you agree is progressive and pragmatic in terms of it being realizable? Do you want someone in place that has the experience of the past six years working through one of the most difficult things one can work through, a pandemic, someone who's been there time and again for individuals, families, and businesses? I have a passion for this community. I want to continue that passion. I want to, I, I'm asking humbly for your support on September 20th so I can continue that work, working with local elected leaders and others to make London a better place. I'm seized with it. This is, as I said, the honor of my life. I'm devoted to it, and thank you very much. Thanks, Peter, and thank you to all of the candidates who joined us today. Peter Fragiscatos, Marianne Hodge, and Dirk Prout. Great debate, lots of rebuttals. I'm sure you guys would probably like to rebut the closing statements. This was a really awesome debate, so I hope everybody who tuned in enjoyed that. Thank you so much to the Aeolian Hall and Clark Bryan for putting on this debate to help our neighbors make informed choices when they exercise their right to vote. I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage you to get out and vote at one of the many accessible polls or on September 20th. 
and to remind you to watch the local results on Rogers TV, September 20th at 9.30 p.m. We've assembled a panel of experts to provide analysis of the results as they come in. I hope you join us. Thank you for being here tonight. This pandemic has taught us that we need representatives in Ottawa who are capable and who can get things done. My name is Stephen Gallant. I'm the Conservative representative for London North Centre. I have a proven track record of excellence, leadership and the ability to get things done. I spent nine years in the Canadian Armed Forces serving our country. I was a reserve officer in the infantry, but I wasn't your typical reserve officer. Eight of the nine years I spent on full-time service. As a lieutenant, I was selected to lead an Arctic expedition, which covered 550 kilometers in the Arctic, all of it above the tree line. I then spent five years in foreign liaison at National Defence Headquarters, where I was rated on my annual performance appraisal as outstanding, which is reserved for the top 15% of military officers. Finally, I was given a Chief of Defence Staff commendation for the excellence in military service. I have 25 years experience in the financial services industry. I have led large departments with multi-million dollar budgets and balanced those budgets to the penny. I have also implemented complex projects under budget and on time. My specialty is operations control, where I have passed audits with flying colors. As a result, I have been awarded five top business awards for excellence and leadership. I have also focused on the London North Centre community and won two community awards. The first one for teaching financial literacy to high school students. The second for the hundreds of hours that I volunteered at the Arcade Street Mission feeding the most marginalized of our society. Aaron O'Toole and the Conservative Party are the only party with a plan to put us on the path to recovery and to secure the future for Canada. My name is Stephen Gallant. I'm running in London North Centre and I need your vote.